realize that most people are being substantially helped. Hmm. And so in that, and that's the same thing with the work with MDMA and treating PTSD. Um, and we saw these results for anxiety and cancer that like six months later, there were, um, on average, people were in the normal across participants in the, and, and most individual participants were in the normal range of these clinician administered scales assessing depression and anxiety. So it doesn't work for everyone. And it doesn't mean that the person doesn't have problems, you know, but it, it substantially helps most people. Maybe we could start just with the what you remember from beginning the trajectory into the psychedelic world. And you were, I think, mentioning a little bit about some of the advice you were getting from your own mentors. Yeah, just that, hey, watch out for this. This is, you know, it looks like it's taking up a lot of your time. And, you know, that might not be good for your career. You know, is this going to go anywhere? Um, so really well-meaning advice. But, you know, I've heard from some folks that have the same folks that said, wow, you know, this is like, that's really cool that this has worked out, you know? And so, you know, but it, you know, but there was, you know, also then like I, I was starting to say the folks at the institution that got really nervous. I mean, it was really like at arm's length. Um, well, okay, I guess this work is happening, but we're not going to claim, you know, we're going to be really cautious and, you know, distance ourselves from it when we can and until the money started coming in. And then just, I mean, it's really sad. I mean, that changed, you know, all of a sudden then the department leadership becomes interested in things when you, when, you know, really sizable funding comes in for it. So that's, that was the one thing that like really changed things. Um, Just to be completely honest, you know, until then it was just like, you know, these threats to shut things down about having some sort of weird political oversight over it, which actually never materialized, but there were some weird things. Um, like the initial study at Hopkins was had to be sent to an external IRB, which is very unusual. Um, uh, and, um, and there are things like I remember just like going to IRB committee meetings and people kind of laughing you know, telling Cheech and Chong, you know, jokes and just sort of like not taking this like seriously, you know, even when getting into kind of the cancer distress work and and just, I don't know. I, I mean, and I get it. I'm, I'm, I'm well known for telling a good joke or, or a bad joke from time to time, but, uh, but still, you know, sometimes you just get a sense, like I'm fine with the joke, but it's like, you know, it's, can you open up to the fact that there's also something here um, that's that's of interest without it just being sort of like there's a lot of smiles sort of like a like like that certain kind of smile like okay I know what's really going on here like I don't know what's really going on here but it's sort of like well it's just cool to like get people high and like I don't I don't know this kind of vibe that you know you're up to no good or this is just I don't know, like just a, a thing of fun for you um, mm-hmm. rather than, and of course, yeah, hopefully, hopefully the work people are doing is they find it interesting. They find it fun, but, you know, not in, you know, absence of the idea that like in this case, you know, there's really, really important scientific um, questions to be asked and including ones that can help people. To me, this this is, and I, I would bet you agree with this, that this is such an important, probably example for the humanness of the scientific endeavor and the uh, the hurdles that somebody like you has socially just has to push through and overcome the conviction that you probably needed to be willing to have other people think that you're a fool um, or that you are way off base in uh how you're orienting your your career. And I wonder if you've given some thought to that about what it was for yourself that gave you the internal conviction that I'm sure you needed to push against the grain. Because anyone who's read the history of scientific progression knows that at the beginning, new ideas that are eventually taken to be scientific truths are often viewed with that same sort of, you know, at least humor, if not outright derision. 
Right. I mean, this, and of course, the the, the historical uh, description of this was um, Thomas Kuhn's the the structure of scientific revolutions from I think 1962, and to, where he used the word paradigm to describe this kind of a change in, you know, kind of big picture changes in science and how it takes, it doesn't take convincing the people that are. And he was very explicit. It doesn't take convincing the people that are out there. It takes waiting for them to die off and a new generation mm-hmm. to take over. Um, and he laid out these like very clear examples. It took a hundred years or I guess more of like 50, 50 to a hundred years, but for, you know, Darwin's origin of species, you know, natural selection to, to even get, start getting traction. And, you know, you know same thing with the Isaac Newton's Principia, the, the laws of motion, you know, I mean, these things are in competition and I, I'm not certainly not putting psychedelics in the same category, but like literally the greatest scientific discoveries, you know, ever made, you know, were just met with, you know, it took a half century for them to take root and and, and were met with, you know, derision. And, um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, and I've come to, I, I've come to think that scientists are not only no better than your average person in terms of falling prey to to fads and to following the way the wind is blowing and what the person in charge thinks is interesting or not and i'll say psychiatry is really bad for that is my impression Mm -hmm. especially but but not only are they no better but they're probably worse on average Mm -hmm. um I mean, you look when, frankly, when societies collapse, typically the scientists and the academics are not the ones that are um, fighting for the right thing they did. They're usually actually the first person to fall in line because it doesn't even like take threatening them with violence like a lot of people. It Just the fear that you may not move up the next rung in your career is enough for 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 you know, a lot of yeah. professional class folks, including scientists. And so there's just a lot of, and, and then just, you know, on any given number of subjects, uh, you know, climate, and to be clear, I, you know, I think climate issues are, are a problem. I think the climate is, is changing and we need, really need to focus on, uh, it's probably only going to be technology at this point that really provides, you know, paths forward. But, um, but you know this talk of whenever I hear anything like ninety nine percent of scientists agree, I just it's like oh that's not the way to sell it, <laughs> you know because like ninety nine percent of scientists thought the sun circled the earth and thought that you know diseases were caused by demons and like you know it's like mm-hmm. you name it like all, all kinds of stuff um you know and and I mean if I know from like NIH funding priorities it's like if they put out a call for grants it's like you know people fall in line i mean i've submitted stuff that i thought wasn't that promising or at least that wasn't at the forefront of what i thought was most significant in terms of like nih grants you know because you know it keeps you afloat and hey you can answer a question maybe it doesn't work out you at least publish the negative results but um you know like there's just such desperation for funding to keep your career in science that you know, you really can't take scientific consensus. Like you have to be very cautious around scientific consensus. And you can see some of the things behind the scenes about how, you know, uh, decisions are made that uh, you can really take advantage of that. So just to be, I think it's just, I don't know what, I don't know what has led me. I mean, my experience with, with the psychedelic research field has certainly cemented this, but was some Something there to, to begin with that made me, I don't know, think differently about these things. Maybe I, I uh, you know, I wasn't uh, very, uh, I don't know. I, I typically had a small number of friends and it wasn't like I was kind of when, like when I was very like young in high school. It's like I was thankfully you know, had somebody and some, you know, small number, but, you know, I was never like kind of big in the popularity game and this type Mm -hmm. of thing. Um, And so maybe that kind of gave me, you know, a bit like of an outsider, I guess. Uh, Maybe that's 
I don't know, uh, you know, maybe that's a part of it. Um, but just kind of being skeptical of what, um, yeah, the prevailing ideas are and kind of then reaching a certain age and then realizing like no one's really, no one really knows what's going on. Um, I remember read, there's a chapter in the autobiography of Kerry Mullis, who invented PCR, who actually says he wouldn't have done so had it not been for his experience with psychedelics. But he, independent of psychedelics, he has a chapter. It's, I think it's something like no one's minding the store or something like this, sort of like kind of in this theme of like no one's in charge. Hmm. Like he realizes as a, as a as a grad as a grad student, he was a, a you know a biologist, and he just he 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 was into astronomy and he submitted a, a, a astronomy paper and got into one of the top journals. Like, I don't know if it was science or nature. It was one of the big, big journals. And he realized, you know, afterwards it got published. He was like, it was a bunch of bunk. It was, it was some stupid idea by a grad, you know, but yet when he first tried to publish the polymerase chain reaction, which absolutely revolutionized all of biology, um, like it was rejected. Mm. And so it's like, it's like no one's in charge. Like, I mean, there are things in this world, especially when humans are like, they don't make sense. And don't assume just because everyone's not, you know, believes in this or thinks this is the right way. Don't assume that that's a reality. And I remember, like, this is one of the things Terrence McKenna would go off in some some of his interesting uh, lectures about. It's like, no one's in charge, not the, consp- not the lizard people, no one. Like, all the conspiracy theories, it's like guess what it's no one <laughs> we're kind of just like walking blindly off of a of a well hopefully not off of a cliff but something like you know don't underestimate how blind we all are and how we're just like we hardly know anything and so i don't know the psychedelic area has only cemented that type of you know seeing it how now it's embraced especially now it's not just the fact that it wasn't taken seriously now that it's taken so so seriously and in fact, even to a degree that's kind of scary at some time, you know, like it it's in kind of this in more naive way. Um, you just you see this kind of like whiplash, you know, mm. and and think, ah, eh, like <laughs> you just see the 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 kind of the herd just get the signal that it's oh now this is this is legitimate now. My friends won't think I'm weird for saying this is interesting, you know, or my boss won't, or my coworkers won't think I'm weird. Now it's sort of like, now that it's okay, everyone's moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. I mean, that so much of that, I think is really worth thinking quite a lot about. And, you know, I know just from the very little I understand about the history of science, you know, uh, Einstein's papers and Darwin's work. I mean, these were two men who were working outside of the uh, structure at that time of formal academia. They were independent agents as I understand their their histories. And um, I want to get into what what you have learned through the many years you've done about um, in, in psychedelic research that you think is important for a public audience to to know. But before we get into there, maybe one last question about the the herd mentality and uh, what you've witnessed in your career that, you know, not only is no one in charge, but that often the people who our leading scientific studies are the most likely to conform. Um, what the root causes you attribute that, that to? Is it primarily status hierarchies? Is it a desire for a need for money and, and uh, an inability to be truly independent and therefore speak one's mind? How do you make sense of that phenomenon, which it sounds like you've seen quite a bit in your career? I think those two things, you know, the status and and uh and the money but also kind of these are all interactive i think institutional corruption Hmm. it's just which ultimately results in a misalignment between what makes for great science and what builds a career Hmm. and so that can be a really strong misalignment and so you can get people building careers out of things that they know the game, how to get publications, how to get grants, how to schmooze, you know, and, but, you know, when you really step back and you see like, what have they, what impact has the work had, Hmm. you know, you don't see much. And so, yeah, like I, I just, you know, it's, 
institution, you know, like, like, for example, I doubt whether anyone like at Johns Hopkins has ever, you know, and in, in the org chart above me has ever read a scientific paper I've done. They, they count up the number of publications, you know, when it comes to like, it's just these kind of blind metrics. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, again, it's like the, the incentive structure. I mean, I'm a behavioral psychologist. That's my first scientific lens. That's my initial training. And so it's like, what are the contingencies? And it's, you know, a lot of times it's like bringing in, you know, universities, it's mainly bringing in the money. Mm. And so it, it, you know, that, that it's not great scientific discoveries and those can go along with each other, but it's, it's a relatively weak correlation. It's a modest correlation at best. So I think that corrupt nature where like perverse contingencies are prevailing in terms of what is governing things um, is a big part of this. And it's like, I mean, that's the, I mean, and really that I see that as the same as why the, the confidence and politicians and in the media and like it's it's all at historic lows at universities and it's for the same reason and i think it's you know it's it's a shame because we do need these institutions you know we need to save these institutions but i I think it's it's not random i mean i think there's an increasing um kind of deterioration of how these places i mean just look at universities with this just dramatic inflation of of uh of bureaucratic positions mm-hmm. and just with this faculty and students are becoming a smaller and smaller and smaller portion of what's going on or less like the center and and even students it's like you know you look at universities attracting students with you know like a lazy river. I think I saw in one exam. Just see you know, this sort of experience kind of thing. It just seems like this, and, and just the ability of universities to be um, really the the center of of the enlightenment of this continuation of this kind of new era. You know, a few hundred years old now of thought, where we can re- just get ideas on the table and 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 freely discuss things, and and that's. In a lot of ways, universities are the last place where you get that now, mm. um, because so many things are just if they're politically incorrect, they're not allowed to be, you know, discussed. So just for many, many, many reasons, there's just a, a, a just, you know, these institutions are just becoming more and more difficult to achieve core missions like teaching students, uh, like conducting good research. Mm. The irony in that is unbelievable how that has occurred. And um, as you were talking about the gamification of career progression in academia and scientific positions, uh, I was thinking about, I don't don't know if you know the name Paul Graham. Um, He's a a technologist and an essayist, and he has written some of my favorite essays I've ever come across. And one of the things he talks about with uh, related to education reminded me of the way that you were describing, as I understood it, uh, how uh, people are gamifying their positions. They know how to play the game to get the money to accelerate their career and not actually do legitimate work. And one of the lines he has from this one essay that I love, which I'd be happy to send to you, is, you know, the worst thing that the worst thing that schools do for people is they teach people to hack bad tests, not to learn, not to do things, not oh, to yeah. be action oriented. Uh-huh. And I've always thought about that line um, because I I know that was me for so much of my younger years. You're looking to get the grade yeah, rather than actually doing the the work. But eventually, I think there's a there's a hollowness to that that uh, isn't particularly satisfying. So that's a short aside there, but. I'd love to put it to you. You know, I always like to have these conversations as though somebody is listening who doesn't know that much about this field and what you've gleaned over the years of you doing this this work. Obviously, you you care deeply about this. And one one thing that I 
kind of came away from primarily of uh, from doing research about you is you know so much of this to me in my reading of your work is you're interested in it's very simple but in helping people and trying to give people tools that can um, you know improve their quality of life and to a lay audience who doesn't know about the work at Johns Hopkins and elsewhere and putting your scientist hat on, you know, what, what are the big main takeaways for you that we've learned or you've learned the field has learned in your career, uh, related to how it can help people. You talked earlier about Mm -hmm. people who are dying of cancer. I know you're very familiar with the research on addiction. That's, this is a huge subject, but Mm -hmm. in general, what, what are, what should the public know about what has been learned over the last 10, 20 more years? I think the the big picture is that one way I've been thinking about it recently is that there's there's an increase in agency that people are more able to make changes. Another way to put that is this is accelerated learning now the direction of that learning isn't necessarily um going to be a good thing just with the pharmacology in fact there's good reason to think you can use these psychedelics to brainwash people like charles manson did and like the the cia was investigating for many years um in fact there may have been a connection between the two of those (laughs) but um uh manson and the cia but the the but that with the right intention and the right goal and the right support that they could and sometimes astonishingly as i've done a bunch of survey and others have outside of even that support sometimes it's you know i think you're tweaking your your gain that you're less likely to have a meaningful life-changing experience when you're just taking it to have fun but sometimes lo and behold that's that's what happens Hmm. and um but certainly maximizing that turning up the game with a therapeutic setting that people can um make the changes in their life that they recognize but seem unable to fulfill that they are stuck in ruts they're stuck at like a local minimum in kind of calculus speak they they mm-hmm. they can't get out of it they are in a suboptimal place they're in a well um whether it's in their overt behavior like in addiction how we define it or if it's in their thought patterns which I just view as internal behavior. It's all behavior. It's just, it's all operating by the same laws, but whether it's the way you think, you know, the self-defeating thoughts and depression or the, with which has behavioral manifestation or with the, you know, behavior, the more behaviorally defined addiction, taking too much of a substance and it causing problems, being unable to stop. And that having obviously, you know, thought, you know, thought, you know, correlates as well, you know, Mm -hmm. um, it's all the same thing. It's people get stuck in these suboptimal patterns and psychedelics can be used to increase one's agency, one ability to feel like they have the degrees of freedom to make a change and to help that sustain. Now, this could be because of the animal work suggesting neuroplasticity we have a lot to figure out there in the the field because we also know things like cocaine cause neuroplasticity but you know we're dealing obviously something with a little a little more special than than cocaine and um so we're still trying to figure out the secret sauce biologically certainly acutely when when the drugs in the system there's a lot of things in the brain happening that are very interesting the brain's taking on a radically different uh pattern of communication within itself that probably is very much related it's probably the reflection of, of that that uh very altered perceptual change that very different interaction with the world and one's the very perception of oneself and how one is in the world but it's such a radically different perspective that people can step away from that they, they can have um realizations that at times touch on ground truth that's not a guarantee because again you can you can you can um be convinced of something delusional Hmm. but um but that can also be a ground truth like greater realizations of the 
of some of the, your own patterns and then one can move that can be so compelling that it sticks with someone um so it really is more like an experience and so in that sense it's it's really more it, it really is psychotherapy it's it's more even though it's prompted by a biological event the ingestion of this substance that has effects on the brain what happens after that is what you would call psychotherapeutic process it's people having a different taking a different perspective on themselves trying out different models different ways to view themselves and reality um embarking on uh you know a different path forward um and in a therapeutic context really a a, ver- a magnification when it's done well of the therapeutic alliance and the support that we know is helpful um across the you know psychotherapy no matter what school of thought some whether a freudian or a cognitive behavioral therapist etc and so people like when someone is better whether they're smoking they overcome smoking addiction to you know, tobacco or they're less depressed or they're less anxious about the cancer six months a year later it's because they've learned something they can tell you a story the same way that someone who I don't know, went through, you know, they got married and had kids and now they're a different person. They're meeting up with their college buddy and they're telling them like how I'm different. Like, Hmm. it's like that. (laughs) It's like, let me tell you about what happened when, you know, um, you know, they learned what it was like to be really be responsible for someone else or to, or to undergo a tragedy in their life or, you know, or visit a different culture for the first time. And, and so like, you know, you can have, there's a narrative around that and, and someone could actually describe how that's changed them. So I think it it is more like a psychotherapy, a learning experience, um, which goes, doesn't guarantee that it's going to be positive, but that's what the, that's what the therapeutic aspect, you know, the set and setting, having good guy, uh, you know, therapists or guides that, um, and it also sets up the, the potential for the abuses, you know, because it is such an intimate, such a, there is such an ability to change somebody that, you know, we've really got to keep on a radar screen. We've got to make sure clinicians are, um, you know, not developing sexual relationships with their clients, which is, that's a thing. It happens far too often, even in regular therapy and in all of these things, the practice of medicine and in psychotherapy, but it's going to be even more so here because of the vulnerability. And you have something even more so here where, someone is the they're providing this access to what what some would call the spirit world or the divine or god or see that's the thing you know in i i view that scientifically you had and clinically you have to be agnostic about that like mm. you know you can neither confirm nor to uh, confirm nor deny for the patient it's just you know they can make whatever they want to at those levels but you're there to support them um, but then, th- but there is this risk of kind of stepping into this role of, of being the guru, mm. um, and pretending that you c- can fill in the holes at those levels about the nature of reality. And it's, it's like, no, it's just, you need to hold the person's hand and be like, I'm here to support you. I can tell you what brain receptors are flying in your brain when this stuff is in, but we ultimately still don't know what's ha- happening. And at those levels who, you know, you're just as much of an expert as I am or anyone else. And so I'm just here for you to help you help this be meaningful for you and, and to, you know, and, and to support you through that process. So I think that needs to be the heart of the, that was a, a tangent, but you know, that the, the vulnerability and the, the plasticity of this is a part of both the potential um, benefit as well as part of why it can be potentially yeah. dangerous if we don't do it right. Yeah. I like the way that you put that, the imagery of being in a well. And, you know, you ticked through some of the different applications uh, just a minute ago for uh, people who are, as I understand it, just have a terminal can- cancer diagnosis and are have a high amount of anxiety. People who are addicted to nicotine, people who are addicted to alcohol. And mm-hmm. uh, my understanding is that very often they they have tried everything that they have access to in normal civilization to try to get out of the, those wells and they can't. Um, and, you know, like so many things in life, the devil is in the details. And I'd love to give you an opportunity to talk about the, you know, this is not a panacea. This is something I've I've heard you 
you know, harp on in articles I've read about you that this is not the a magic bullet uh, or a silver bullet. Uh, it's not a magic pill. But what what are the success rates looking like? in these domains of life where people are metaphorically in a well, they're not in a good place. And the, these experiences seem to help get them out of that well. Yes. One of the reasons I really was attracted to the smoking cessation area, aside from having done work going back to early grad school on tobacco and nicotine is the fact that it's so easy to biologically verify. So I can, (laughs) we can be a little more, it's not like some rating scale, which nothing, you know, it's, use the best tools you have, but for some of these other stores they are inherently like, you know, these other clinician or patient administered scales. Um, but I, you know, with the smoking, we could breathe through this, you know, go take a piss and like, I'm going to analyze your urine. <laughs> we can like <laughs> trust, but verify. And yeah. so like we're getting, I just recently completed a, a trial where we're at a year at a year out it looks like we're um compared to nicotine patch over doubling the success rates of helping people quit smoking so a year out 52 percent um st- um still abstinent um that uh in our first pilot it was and that's by the way that was what i just told you was, was only a single session of psilocybin in our pilot mm-hmm. study with with one um uh with three sessions we had 80 percent percent biologically confirmed it was a small sample 15 people but 80 percent at six months for smoke free and we went out to two and a half years a very long-term follow-up and 60 percent were smoke free for so these are very high success rates because the best medications at you know six months a year you're talking about stuff in the 20 percent third the be- very best like in 30 percent and same thing with like talk therapy um so you just don't get the only the best treatment that's ever been published before that this is um if you had not one but two medications and you kept people on continuous talk therapy for an entire year mm-hmm. then you got somewhere in the 50 percent um that was some some really good work but it's like yeah that's a lot you know mm-hmm. so it there, there really are like you know high success rates but then for like say depression there have now been a number of studies but what is typically seen is that in the studies that have gone out this long. So, um, you know, so, uh, one to several months later, you know, people, uh, will, uh, you'll get 70 plus percent that are, um, in, in remission, meaning their, their levels are low enough into the, into the, the normal range of the scale. And you'll get, um, uh, like even higher numbers of that, you'll there's even higher numbers that are um achieving what's called a significantly clinical a clinically significant reduction so like having of their of their symptoms um so um very high so most people are being substantially helped hmm. and so in that and that's the same thing with the work with MDMA and treating PTSD um and we saw these results for anxiety and cancer that like six months later there were um pe- on average people were in the normal across participants in the, and the and most individual participants were in the normal range of these clinician administered scales assessing depression and anxiety so it doesn't work for everyone and it doesn't mean that the person doesn't have problems you know but it it substantially helps most people now, these are also trials that are, you know, there's a lot of things we're excluding because as the research goes on and as it gets into clinical practice, there's going to be less exclusions. And, and so it's, you know, the results invariably, and this is the pattern in science, they're not going to be as good. Hmm. And I, you know, um, but nonetheless, things are looking so good in these samples that that even if they're, even if they turn out to be half as good, that's still really, really good compared to what's out there. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's a weird balance because it's like it's not a panacea, and it's you really get nervous when someone comes in. So this is my last hope. This is I've done everything, and, and it's like no, 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 no. Like it, that's a dangerous way to think because it may this may not be the thing, and you have no one's done anything because we know even with with all of these disorders, like sometimes you do the same thing on the fifth try, and then it works. It's like mm-hmm. yeah, just because you tried to you know use one of these existing medications or even something like, you know, nicotine patch. It's like, 
you may have tried it before, but it might actually work for good this time. So it's like you mm-hmm. always want to encourage people to never give up and to and, and we have a science behind that. It's like, and just under my opinion, it's like we know mm-hmm. it's it's true. The more the more attempts, pre, even if you fail, ultimately, mm-hmm. it's actually not a failure because it's it makes you more likely to be successful the next time. And the same general thing is true for all of these disorders. So you you, you get nervous when people see this as their only hope because it doesn't work for everyone. Um, I, I think it's going to be also a more complex landscape when it's in clinical treatment. I think we need more research on repeated treatments. Some people, it seems to help a lot, but then it fades in a few months. Um, some people, it seems to still be helping, but a year later, they say, you know, I'm still getting benefits, but wow, it does seem like just to do this once a year, it could really help me out. And so it, it seems that you know, I think you're going to see that it's going to be more like, especially when you're talking about like treatment resistant depression, I think on the ground, it's going to be more of a, you know, certainly very different than standard psychiatric, you know, take this pill every morning and it's going to reduce symptoms. But having a session once every two months, three months mm-hmm. might be more of the norm, mm-hmm. um, more in line with maybe sort of like ECT. Um, so you do the sun some or now like you know t- um you know people go on it wouldn't be as freaking it's like tms that um the magnetic stimulation of the brain so um but yeah it, it's you know it's people shouldn't hold their breath that it's going to be the one thing that saves them but it is really promising i think it's going to help a lot of people that haven't been helped to date but yeah. that's not going to be everybody. And it's not the only thing. And the other thing with it not being a panacea is that when it works, it really seems to be because that's it, it's that person is doing their own psychological heavy lifting. And that's part of the agency. It's not like this thing just automatically. It, it, it seems to be the person is really at the center of it. And it's not just treating symptoms. That's why it can go to the core of some of these, this, these psychological issues because the person is at the center of it. And they can have a different relationship with how they're handling their own life. Mm. And they can have this conscious change in how they're orienting, like just what they're doing, how they're thinking and behaving on a daily basis. Mm. So it, it, which means it can be really hard. Like in these treatments can be very difficult. And that means it's not for everyone. Not everyone would, would be interested in doing this. Because sometimes it can be a, it can be a very frightening experience. It can also even if you come there like just to quit smoking, it could unearth some trauma. Hmm. I'm not talking about recovered memories you didn't, but you know, um, but but yeah, just something that you thought like, well, that's that's a thing. It's been years ago, but man, that can kind of you know kind of come up and be like, no, I'm the thing that needs to be dealt with here. Because something happens like the psychological defense mechanisms. We don't know this. We need more research on it. But it seems descriptively something like that is happening, like the the defense mechanisms are lowered and someone – things can hit people really hard in a way they didn't before. They just kind of see themselves from this kind of like naked perspective and they're like, oh. And that can go really deep. Yeah. Um, yeah. God, I really appreciate you saying all that. Um Do you think just in terms of the, you were mentioning that, you know, it sounds like there is some difference for, it's not a panacea, but it sounds like with repeated attempts and tweaking and, you know, feedback loops and applying reason to this, that, uh, that is the way to go there. There's a bit of a bespoke aspect to this that's individual. And would you say a fair analogy to this might be something like diet that broad strokes, Lots of vegetables, exercise, um, whole foods are good. But in terms of the ideal diet for an in, for a specific person, that is really unique to that individual. Even though at a high level, we can say with high confidence that certain activities are certain foods are better than others. Yeah, that that there will ultimately be an individualized you know, treatment for people. I, I think that's going to be true. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that's sort of like the holy grail of medicine and generally, although I have to say other than 
cancer chemotherapy, which actually really has, I've seen some dramatic examples of now things that were thrown out. Now we know that your genetics, you specific mm. genotype. And now, the, now this drug is like really a lifesaver, but um, mm. for the most part, individualized medicine has been a big failure in mainstream medicine, but it's uh doesn't mean we're not going to get there. But I, I do think, um, I think there's a lot of hope there, particularly more along the lines of what you're talking about, like with health and nutrition. Um, probably it's a better example than with medicine, which it's a shame there's a different categories, but unfortunately they they are the way we treat them. But like just things I think, you know, I'm 49 and the stuff that like I figured out, like I just can't do like the exercises you can do and can't do. And you see examples of like I've known multiple people in there like 60s or 70s that are think they're really healthy and but they just don't listen to their body and just they they have to have knee replacements because they just they were running an hour a day and it's like it wasn't good for them mm. you know or the thing they thought was good for them wasn't or they get into this type of diet and it doesn't fit so i think yeah like um diet's probably a good example where there's people have to know what's right for them and like this won't be for everyone and maybe they'll I mean, I think there will be different options like MDMA is probably going to be a more palatable option for many people that say wouldn't be up for at least a high dose of a yeah. of a, something like psilocybin, a classic psychedelic, because it's less of the potentially like reality itself is unzipping. And I don't know what the hell is even I don't even know I'm a human. Like, what is this? You know, it's not that you can have a bad trip on MDMA, but it's more of like being an emotional despair Mm. You know, like, for example, in dealing with trauma, but that's like directed towards a therapeutic goal. But, you know, it's more palatable. It's one of the reasons why it's a, it's a more reliable um, in terms of just the recreational use. It's like it's easy to get together and dance on. And there's very few unsatisfied customers where it's like, <laughs> there's plenty of people where they took too many mushrooms on the dance floor. They're like, holy shit, get me out of here. Or they end up like on the floor in the corner, like and everybody has to these tending to them the whole time. MDMA is sort of like a little gentler. Um, mm. And, uh, and, and so there'll be menus out there for people, I think. Um, and I, but, and I also think given that, like, you know, I, I do think there's strong potential to have some survey. I haven't data, I haven't published yet, but um, it seemed to suggest that like, there's probably potential for all of these, like whether it's the fact that MDMA has been pursued for PTSD and it's looking so good and probably would be the first approved, or that, you know, psilocybin for depression or psilocybin for addictions. It's like you could scramble these up because I think there are those general mechanisms. So MDMA for Vincess has done a bit of work on, on this MDMA for addiction, like alcoholism or, you know, um, uh, you know, psilocybin for PTSD. You know, mm. my prediction is there's going to be a room for all of this and there's going to be efficacy with all of that. And so you know, perhaps it may come down to this individual tailoring of what sounds like the the thing that fits their personality best. And I also think the diet and exercise just example is a good one because that gets to the agency part of um, this. Like this is way more like really finding a good diet and exercise that fits you than it is like, like Ozempic. <laughs> like this is not like <laughs> easy, you know, this is um, and, and if it works, it's going to work. It has the potential to feed forward mm. in terms of establishing new pat, new patterns. Um, and, and, and I'm a big, big believer that we shouldn't give up our agency and just, yeah, mm. like the, some of the, the supposed people in charge of, uh, um, I, yeah, the people pushing Ozempic and whatnot, <laughs> this idea that like, oh, diet and exercise have no like potential for helping people. Oh, they fail. And it's like, well, maybe we're not doing it right. Cause like, you know, you're not violating the laws of, of mass energy. Like P and I've known plenty of people and, and I, I, I get very, very discouraged when people send these message culture culturally that you have no agency hmm. and that it's only this, you know, this one medication, you know, and I've, you know, I don't want to, I, I want plenty of tools for all, for clinicians. And so, you know, but there's risks and benefits to all of these things. And sometimes there's some major downsides for some of these options, not to say that they're never useful or called for, but, um, 
but so I, I just, you know, I view psychedelics in that same kind of lens of like, I want to maximize human agency. I want like to people to feel empowered. I want to be able, and like sometimes people say, man, I feel weird smoking a cigarette around you. This will be like at some meeting later on hanging out. They're like, I feel weird. Like I'm smoking. I was like, yeah, I'm fine with smoking. <laughs> like it's just like, it's like, I just want to help you. If someone wants to quit, I want to yeah. help them quit. Like, I don't want to force anyone. I'm, I'm well embedded in the tobacco field. Like most of the scientists, like they're very kind of anti-smoking. I'm like, I, you know, I just, I just want to empower people to, 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 um, to reach their own goals. And if you want to, you know, get smoking out of your life and there's, there's good reason to, I mean, uh, like, yeah, like I'd love to, to help people do that. And so just this sense of agency is like the big thing for me that the psychedelics are about. It's about letting people flourish, you know, in this kind of internal conflict that we have around so many of these things, whether it's thinking about yourself from a certain perspective or, or engaging in this habit or this addictive behavior that you, in in many of your moments, you know, you need to get away from. It's like, this can kind of get all the, using a metaphor here, but all of the aspects of the psyche around the same boardroom table and be like, all right, guys, no one's leaving it until we're figuring this out. And then we're going to be on the same page and we're going to do it. You know, like we're going to, you're not going to have this like compartmentalized motivation. Hmm. And so it's like this maximizing agency is kind of, that's the way I've been thinking about it more recently. I know just in, in what I've read about you and your own life. I mean, I think you, you, my read is that you tend to have more of a holistic approach to life, that this is a tool, but you know, you seem like somebody who's, you know, exercising many times a week and spends a lot of time with your family. And that this is a component to, as you said, trying to make people live a, a flourishing life and to be able to achieve their goals. And I wanted to read a couple of quotes from you about psychedelics in general and then ask you a question about one of your former okay. colleagues. Here's one, um, which I thought was, so, I had never really thought about it this way, but this is, this is from you that quote, one of the hallmarks of psychedelics is just their variability. It's not the mean, but the standard deviation. And I think you alluded to this earlier in the conversation <laughs> about just how wide the experience uh, can be. And I think set and setting probably have something uh. to do with that. Uh, I don't remember that. I sounded like a real nerd. That's <laughs> <laughs> I, that may have That's been. Awesome. I, I, I think yeah. that may have been when you were talking to Lex. Who? I, I okay. Think, uh, yeah. Probably yeah. Really he probably that. helped me go along the the nerd path. Like <laughs> I, I love to nerd out with good nerds. Yeah. Totally. This um, is. Um, yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. One. I'll, one I'll still. One. I'll still stand by that statement. Yeah. 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 Fair enough. And there's there's one other one that. Uh, that you said, which you said often, this is a paraphrasing, but often during a psychedelic experience, it hits people so hard how much they love people. People, um, this is just like related to how how profound these experiences can be. You were mentioning something in an article I was reading about mental health care in America, and this is this is a line I read from you that quote: "It's mental health care in America." Quote: "It's in dire straits right now. We're seeing that for the first time ever." Americans' life expectancy is lowering, not increasing, with the two big factors being addiction and suicide. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think, and I mean, you were talking about what the results are right now, and these substances seem to be perfectly catered to uh, potentially helping with these. And then the final one is that uh, in terms of the optimism that you were just alluding to and the future, um, in looking towards a healthy future, quote, where we have a thinking about, and I I heard this from uh, a former guest of mine, uh, Roland uh, Levy, I think his name was, who started mm-hmm. Field Trip Health. And he, mm-hmm. he made yeah. this offhanded comment when I was talking to him about how, you know, he thought in the future, uh, this would be sort of like a dentist appointment that people a couple times a year, if, you know, to stay healthy, that this would be you know, doing ketamine treatment or doing MDMA or some using one, some of these tools to try to bolster their life. And this is a line from you about the f- a future quote where we have routine mental health checks. How how it, how it is a how is it a thing to have physical checkups every year, but not a mental health checkup, which I thought was was pretty profound. Um, 
I don't know if you want to comment on, on any of that, but uh, those were some of the more interesting things I, I came across in you know, doing some research on you. Yeah, honestly, like that last one, I man, I think of like the school shooting thing and I just think, how are we not having mental? Why is that just not norm? Like, yeah, maybe you could skip it, but it was like, you don't want to like necessarily tell your name. Oh, I haven't been in the dentist in 10 years. It's kind of embarrassing. Like it should be kind of embarrassing to like, <laughs> hopefully we move into a culture where it's like, it's uh, it's like the norm. Just, of course you, you're going to see someone like a couple to whatever it is, like some routine, like, you know, every three months or, or maybe once a month, you know, it, it just, it's almost like, I don't know, like when I think of uh, known people in the military, it's like, yeah, you keep your weapon clean. Like mm-hmm. you don't like, like you, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like if you never defrag your hard drive or I guess you don't really need to do that these days, but like, you know, like whatever, just throw away your, you know, clean out your, your files or something. Um, it just seems like it's, or you, yeah, you never e- exercise because like things go to entropy mm-hmm. um, and and yeah, so I, I do think it's just hard to imagine. Like, I often think like, like we're here at a blink of an eye, like we're going to be a, like, well, we may not like, but if we're around in 500 years, like if we don't, something extraordinary is going to happen. Either we're going to like go extinct soon. That's going to be extraordinary. Or we're going to be around in 500, a thousand, 5,000, 10,000, a million years. Like that's extraordinary too. Like yeah. what in the world is that? Like, and even like a hundred years from now, it's hard for me to imagine if we haven't knocked ourselves back to the stone age, it's like, how are we not going to be hardcore with mental health? How are we not going to have this, like, not perfect, but much more of an understanding of the mind. And, and how could it not be that we need this increase in mental preventative health care? I mean, look at like medicine, dentistry, like, it's like, that's like, that's the thing that, that taken care of a whatever cleaning your gun or whatever like whatever your example is uh um i'm not a big gun enthusiast don't ask me why that was the thing that came to my mind but like you know like you you yeah you want to keep your tools um in shape and and uh and 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 it just strikes me that we don't we don't we we check in when things it's the equivalent our mental health is the equivalent of like only seeing the doctor when you've your tumor is so big that it's like bulging out of your neck. Yeah. It's like, that's what we're doing with mental health. And like, let's wait till the kid just throws up his hands and he just goes on a rampage or whatever. And it's like, we need to really, really check. I mean, I think this is the idea for like school counselors and what, but it's never been realized. It's never been, you know, as far as I know, just fully realized where everyone has this like, you know, person that really knows them that can keep a tab not just to check it, but to help for that person's help, you know, for them to like be able to open up to and discuss things. And like, if things start going off the path. So I do think that's just like, that's, um, I hope that happens. And I think psychedelics are a part of not necessarily that everyone's going to get a psychedelic trip all the time, but like, but just the interest the the ma- psychedelics is a magnifying lens for society. Like by bridging psychiatric treatment with psychology, once again, like it is about like this unfolding narrative of you as a person and the story of your life. And, and it's important to kind of keep ownership of that. So I think that that's going to be um, something that's, yeah, we should have a, a, a check-in on and like as a way to kind of keep our, our engine, that's probably a better example, keep your engine running clean, you know, get an oil change, you know, like, check your fan belt every once in a while. Cause it's going to snap when you're on some just long trip. Like you gotta, yeah. you gotta make sure these things are running. You can't just like never change your air filter. It's like, yeah. Um, and then the other exam- examples you gave, I don't, uh, yeah, it's like, it's more about the variability. Like it's true. It's, it's, it's very wild. Like the classic psychedelics, like still have more than MDMA. Like I was saying before, it's just like, they're just wild in their potential, um you know effects um which is really a, a crazy given their relatively minimal mental uh, i'm sorry physical effects it's like mm. they dilate the pupils a little mm. bit raise the blood pressure a little bit for most people if it's if you're at severe cardiac risk that could be a problem but 
for most people, there's pretty minimal somatic effects, but like this wild change in mental function that could go any number of directions. And you could, you could know what it's like to be going completely crazy, Mm. you know, at times and just engaging in completely delusional thoughts. And then, but then have this, some of the clearest moments of one's life seemingly, you know, and, um, with this clarity and, and just with, you know, things seemingly self-validated in terms of life priorities. And, um, so it's just this wild range of, and this like absurd laughter over just the craziest things, you know, it's just like, there's that too. And just sometimes people get just completely cracked up at this whole idea of existence. It's like, this is weird. Like, Mm -hmm. Or just like these people walking around and, you know, like, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's like being blown out of context, you know, like where people um, are kind of, we're used to things. We're used to think like this is normal. And I think one of the things psychedelics do is kind of remove that. And then people are always like, wow, this is like not normal. This is, it's from one perspective, a miracle that like, we're these beings and we can interact with these other beings and we have these things we're, that we're trying to do. And we, and it's just a very absurd kind of thing, a miraculous thing, an absurd thing, a, a, a sometimes like a hilarious thing, but people have such wildly different perspectives on reality that they could take all these different perspectives. And it, it seems like that's a good, that seems to be good for people like, you know, that can safely do it um, in the right setting that, because like uh i don't know there might be something about just like having that broad context like yeah sometimes it helps to be like you know take a perspective like like bill hicks would talk about like you know life is just a wild ride man and it's like some of the people with psychedelics be like dude like yeah life is just a ride and the more you can take that perspective the better off doesn't mean you're supposed to be lazy about things but it's like yeah like we're you know engage in the game as well as you can do the thing but at the same time don't you know when things go wrong just to have that kind of broad perspective it's you know it's 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 easier said than done like for sure and but i think psychedelics can leave people with this impression that things are so big and that we're lucky to be having what we're having that it could yeah like kind of reset people recalibrate them to what's important or not and not take things so seriously yeah, for sure. I, I think um, one of the things you were mentioning earlier, I mean, what, what could be more important than people's psychological state and mental health? And perhaps one of the things that is just helpful in that domain is persuading people that the the mind is a muscle and that mm. you were talking about agency earlier and that, uh, you know, with the right habits of mind and habits of life, that your baseline experience of this world might be significantly better than what you tend to be experiencing life as being. And there, there's a great book. I bet you've probably heard of this. Uh, I think it's called The Precipice by Toby Ord, uh, or to- Toby Orb, which he talks it. about. It's basically um, it like a, an existential risk book. And he's making the the case basically that the next hundred or so years are the most important hundred or so years in the history of humanity because one of the two outcomes you just articulated will come about. Right. Either yeah. We will go extinct or go back to the Stone Age, or we will very likely develop, you know, technology and just interplanetary uh, yeah. life. We in can't a way even that, imagine. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. And yeah. that that these years are so precious because there's so much on the line for, you know, the future of consciousness and the future of humanity. And I, that I remember coming across those ideas, and they're kind of mind blowing when you think about the the era that we're living in. Um, yeah, that I, sounds like a sounds like a great uh, a read because I yeah, it's, it's like we're in this like four billion year. Well, depending how you frame it, like whatever 13 billion year like relay race and it's like now the universe is like has this ability to look at itself and to you know to have this experience and now it's like we're and we're so close to being like to exploring the stars and and just 
you know, I, I mean, who knows what we're going to figure out. And, and like, and once we do that, once we escape the planet, it's like, we're kind of guaranteed because then we have the diversity. It's like, okay, even when the sun explodes, like we could go on. So it's like, we're like 13 billion years in. And if we don't make the next hundred years, like it's right. Cause like we're back, you know, like it's, you know, we've only, we're the monkeys that just developed these nuclear bombs like yesterday, basically in the scheme of things. And it's like, you know, are we going to make it or not? It really is like right now that's going to determine this like, and who knows, maybe it's happening all kinds of places throughout the universe, but at least the 4 billion years on our, our planet, like we're, it's taken this long to get there, you know, and it'd be such a shame to like have to, you know, for that to like be reset. I mean, we'd probably pick ourselves up back in a few million years, like, mm. You know, if we knocked ourselves at the, but who knows? Like, <laughs> if we go back to microbes, like, you know, <laughs> it might take us hundreds of millions of years um, to catch back up. It, yeah, that, we shouldn't that, screw it up. We should like keep this relay race going. You know? Absolutely, yeah. And I, I think anything that can be done to enhance, you know, human well-being and hu human mental health is a step in that direction of trying to keep the relay race going and uh, you know i know we're getting towards the end of the conversation and i want to i want to close on um a couple of of just quick points i had a chance to email a little bit with uh your former coworker who who died last year um uh roland griffins and i was coming across, i was reading his it's basically an obituary obituary of his in the new york times last night i think he died last october um and he seemed to be someone way ahead of the curve. And uh, there's a quote in the New York Times article I wanted to read, which talked about the work he was doing at his death. And the the line is, quote, at his death, he was, con he was completing a paper about a study he had conducted in which clergy from a wide range of faiths received a high dose of psilocybin to see how it, it would affect their life and work. And, you know, I... I have to imagine anyone like yourself that's been involved in this world for so long, uh, like Roland's curiosity about these substances. And I know he is, he was, um, a scientist like you are that he was also interested in the spiritual, um, and the unknown. And I'd love to give you an opportunity just to comment about him and also that line about the work he was doing towards the end of his life and how, you know, your work and your experience with these people who uh, you've worked with for, for so many years, how it's affected your metaphysical outlook, how it's affected your your religious views, your non-religious views, your outlook on on life in general. Yeah, yeah. I'd say um, my perspective is that it's one thing to be, to, to you know, kind of... Um, discuss the spiritual and but on the ground it's it's like how you how you treat other people hmm. so ethics um and yeah for me I, and in fact in the psychedelic field i've the psychedelic field has been a big part of of me uh, uh, like cementing kind of something I already knew, but not nearly as well that like that. That it really comes down to treating. It's how you treat your fellow, you know, human being and that kind of utopian visions of, you know, kind of spirituality and kind of a, an interest in spirituality can can really be a cloak mm. you know this thing called spiritual bypassing really is a, a is a real thing and so i don't know like sometimes in conversations like this i go out like i try to stay grounded but you know i like to speculate on but what i we really hope even conversations like that i'm not letting people we're conveying is that i have any answers to the big you know what i mean like sure. I, I just I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm no one's guru. I, 
you know, everyone has it's it's fun it's fun to speculate on what um and I have might have my own ideas about uh, you know about what's the big picture of going on is, but um you know, I want I want the psychedelic field to stay grounded and recognize that we can have a tendency to kind of um engage in these utopian visions. And when that happens, it can be a recipe for um for unethical behavior, hmm. for for really sacrificing anyone in the in the quest for that utopian vision and you see that with different religions you see it in political philosophies you see it in you know political revolutions where you know where the the pure become sacrificed you know you know like the bolsheviks turning on their fellow socialists during in the early years and sending them you know to be killed or to the gulags um, so it's just a, it's just sort of a common theme. And so it's just one of the things that I want to focus on and that I've learned because of the psychedelic field and my interactions in it is that um, you don't know the book by its cover and that you. Yeah, yeah, like psychedelics and spiritual experiences will never replace an understanding of ethics and some of those lessons that we learn through life experience, through good literature, through you know uh you know through the people that we meet um and for you know for some people through religion but yeah we really have to kind of stay grounded in in ethics when we get into the spiritual realm which can mean many things for many different people hmm. fair enough and i'd be remiss if i didn't ask you because this was one of my my favorite points from this conversation about um you were talking earlier about what it was like 20 years ago to uh want to get into this field and the mocking reaction seemingly that that you often receive from people who heard about that interest and i'm curious for you if there are other areas of exploration or inquiry or truth that you know in your mind are in that same bucket that psychedelics were in 20 years ago that we're not talking about but we really should be you know if there right. are any if, there, if there's anything not even necessarily related to the mind but not close to that what what if anything comes to mind in your mind to um maybe convey to curious minds that might be listening to this who um have that same sort of spirit of adventure and independence that um, you seem to have exhibited throughout your career yeah i can think of a few things like the first the first one that comes to mind is the ufo phenomenon i think anyone that just dismisses it as if it's a complete joke and that there's it's not even now i'm saying i'm i'm not saying one has to be con, like convinced of one way or the other but you know i think if someone exposes themselves to the data they will be perplexed mm. like there's something extraordinary going on and frankly i think the idea that some of this technology is somehow china has leapfrogged the western powers by like decades or centuries is pat frankly it's more difficult to pass occam's razor than the idea that there's some type of whether it be interstellar or maybe there's been another civilization here that's we're not aware of like s something truly extraordinary i i mean i think you know there's enough data to suggest that it's at least arguable that that's more likely than yeah. any any human being you know and 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 if so that would be a progression of this this thing where we've always put ourselves you know the civilization thousands of years ago that thought they were the only people that someone finally took that canoe past the horizon where they couldn't see land anymore and most of those people died and some of them actually hit some other land mass and there's other people and then you know fast forward to 500 years ago and then it's like or i guess a thousand you know somewhere in that you know it's like there's an entire hemisphere you know <laughs> you know that the others didn't that at least the people on the other land mass didn't eurasia didn't know about and africa didn't know about and 
you know, and then it's like, you know, you get to Galileo and Copernicus and this, like the, uh, you know, it's like, oh, you know, like these heavenly bodies, it's like, maybe we're not at the center of this, what we came to know as the solar system. And so it's like this kind of decentering of us not being special, the whole idea of like, we were being visited or being monitored it's like something you know if there's some other you know um intelligent life form it would be a continuation of that i'm not saying i'm certain but i'm 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 open i think there's likely something like that going on hmm. um but the important thing is that i'm open yeah and i think i see that same type of of mockery and i just it just i don't see to me it's it's frustrating that people don't take that seriously to just weigh the evidence for what's happening because i think especially now when like you know there's a lot out there now since 2017 where you've got to bend over like something weird is happening like either we have like some crazy technology and like some part of our government and then why would they be flying that around like u.s strike carriers and the navy like what is this like the air force like screwing with the navy like why would they do that like i don't know it just there's things that just don't doesn't make sense and so another thing i would put into that category is like psi phenomenon and i would say the same thing like this for people that it's used to be called paranormal but you know telepathy and um telekinesis um remote viewing those are the three big you know kind of categories but you know, I'm I'm very open. I'm 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 somewhat read on that science, and I think that's a whole area of science that, again, I won't say I'm 100 percent convinced, but I think there's likely something going on there. And um, in fact, if there is something going on, if there's a real effect there, it's not supernatural. It's just an aspect of nature that we don't understand yet. You know, maybe that maybe there's some sort of communication or interaction through these other dimensions that physicists speculate and some are more convinced are there that we're not percept perceiving of you know, maybe it's that maybe it's some you know em waves would have sounded like magic you know hundreds of years ago it's like maybe there's some other form of you know who knows you know mm -hmm. um and, and for somebody who has never read anything about this and is hearing about this for the first time what what have you learned specifically that persuades you especially with the second component the paranormal component that there there might be something there um what are the stories that you recall if if any about you know these possibilities that really made you you know scratch your head and think there's something there you know i i read um some actually it started with years ago Probably like 15 years ago, I started re a buddy of mine down the hallway at work, like sort of another scientist sort of dropped a paper, threw it on my desk, says, Johnson, read this. Like, and it was one of these papers from Rupert Sheldrake, who he actually in the old days had these trilogues with Terrence McKenna. And, um, um, and, and anyway, so he's kind of had some connection in the psychedelic field. But, and he's come up with this biological theory of morphogenetic fields, which, you know, I'm yeah, I always want to be open, but no, I'm I'm not thinking that's likely to be true. That seems a little out there and, and without the evidence. But um, but he came up with these experiments that he he wrote a book saying, like, you know, like I forget what something like seven experiments you can do at home to like, and it it it's it and and uh he's published a bunch of papers, peer-reviewed papers on these effects, but they there's things he he's very much into these experiments, not and they're sort of the antithesis of what if you're familiar with the like the Gansfeld experiments where like the ping pongs in the eye and like you're you're seeing what random image is projected in the other room, or you're or or the the work that uses like the long digits of, of random numbers to seeing whether there's a, a deviation from man. These are very sort of arcane things that are like his point is that when people report these phenomena in real life, at least the stories, whether you buy it or not, they tend to be things that are very person centric. So in other words, things like a woman, uh, attractive woman, getting a sense that someone's 
like eyeing her some some creep is like you know mm. staring her up from the back you know and like oh behold there's someone there or or a dog acting really weird before it's you know its owner comes home like someone else in the house is mm. like yeah the dog went crazy and then like you were home and like mm. and, and, or and the one that he's done a lot of work with is this um telephone the phenomenon of of somebody uh saying yeah i was just th- haven't thought of you in months but i was just thinking of you and like you call I called him like, what the hell? Like it was you. Um, and so it's that one where he devised these experiments and he's published a bunch of times on it. And he even did it on live. I don't know if it was live, but it was reported. Um, it might have been live, I'm not sure, but on some British television show, you know, back well over probably like 20 years ago. But this this basic paradigm where you um uh have a certain number of people, like four callers, and um at given time points you randomly select which one of these four callers is going to call the recipient mm. and they make a guess who is once the phone is ringing, who is calling before they pick up the phone and I actually replicate it. Cause I read so many of these papers. He's actually done it by email and, um, and several times like, um, and he's found interesting like relationships, like somebody, it seems to be somebody with social closeness. Like the accuracy is higher with someone's like sister who may be separated from Singapore to London than it is with like, mere acquaintances of someone who's just across town um or a couple of blocks away so it seems to be more of like emotional closeness rather than physical proximity that drives things if you buy into any any of this but mm-hmm. like i said i dove into it and i'm like either they're making stuff and stuff up or it seems like there's something here because there's all these little things even these and some of these side researchers are forced to to really be exp- go down experimental rabbit holes that most of us are actually go beyond what most science needs to do like things like oh well what if people are like microseconds off and you just know unconsciously oh that one of those four people is Oh, that's Larry. He's always a little late on things or whatever. And mm. so it's like maybe you picked up that and didn't know it. They've even done things where they've used a random gener- a time generator to not make it on the, you know, like the given, you know, 805 or whatever it's supposed to be, mm. but to to scramble up the timing to to make sure that wasn't a confound. And it's held up to all of this. And so I ran one of these myself with my wife and did it as rigorously as any study of I've I've ever done. And got very significant results um so so the chance that it was that her accuracy was as high as it as it was was one out of 500 so it was a p-value of 0.002 so it's a pretty straightforward statistical binomial distribution it's one of four callers we had 24 trials april wasn't like we ran it did p-hacking ran it till we you know um you know got a significant effect you said no based on the literature base it should be 20 is a 24 is a safe you know, if it's, we're going to call it based on that. And so the accuracy was like 13 out of 24, which is well, the null hypothesis is it's only six. Hmm. And so it's actually extreme. Each, each additional person beyond six, one fourth of tw- uh, is, I'm sorry. Yeah. Six. Yeah. One fourth of tw- hmm. 24 is, is like, you know, it gets more, the st- statistics are, it's like way and way less probable. Mm-hmm. So you get up to 13, it's a, only a one in 500 chance that you would get that by chance alone. Now it doesn't prove, but, and yes, there could be some, like maybe she was tricking me through some very, very sophisticated way. It's like, whatever, like maybe, I mean, to me, that's in the category of, I don't know, maybe Martians were like mm. manipulate, you know, like it's like, mm. it's a, uh, to go to the alien example, but like, yeah, who knows? There could always be something else, but I don't think so. And, um, it, but it also could be just chance. It could, it could have been the one in the 500. Um, I haven't really followed up with doing a bunch of these things, but that's the one time that I delved into it myself. And I was astonished by the results because I had read all this literature. Then I tried it the one time by myself and came up with, you know, and she is the type of person who's not nearly as interested as me, but, but it seems that if there is something like this, it seems to run in her family. Hmm. Um, these stories that we've all heard of people that weird things happening at weird times, these weird synchronicities. So Hmm. I'm, I'm thinking there's probably something, probably 95%. Again, I'm not, you know, a hundred percent, but I think you know, there's probably something going going on there that we just don't understand. I think it's just another level of nature that we're not sensitive to. And the type of thing that we'll look back on, like, you know, like a 
you know, kind of like if you'd shown a cell phone to someone 500 years ago or even 100 years ago, it's like the only way to explain it. That's just magic. It's 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 a you know, it's a God calling device. It's like mm. it's like it bounces up into the heavens and the signal comes down to it's like it's just magic, you know. And so that's the level that we're at probably with if this stuff is is real. Um but, you know, it, it leads to then, like, you know, there's all kinds of stuff. Like, we don't really know that, you know, we don't know what consciousness is. We don't know if matter is secondary to consciousness or matter is, you know, like, if consciousness comes from, and like, you know, but if some of these phenomena are real, that's another kind of layer of, like, yeah, maybe there's this, um, um, uh, in fact, one of the the books a summary of the literature i think dean radin was the author like the conscious universe he kind of summarizes a lot of the science in this area of psi phenomenon and so yeah maybe there is this is all to be clear speculation i don't you know but you know maybe there is something to the idea that if consciousness was primary somehow and matter of as a manifestation that that might be somewhat of a one way where some of these phenomena are are, are plausible I don't know. Um, but yeah, those are some weird things. And again, I try to be open. I also want to be open to me being wrong about those things. But I just, you know, those happen to be ones where I think like, yeah, just weighing the evidence seems like something really weird is going on. And I think just most of us are just, and especially in science, in fact, there's science on this, like that, that the general public is more open on this stuff. And the more you get, like you get into the humanities, people are a little more skeptical than you get into like, you get into areas like psychiatry that you get like really skeptical. Mm. Um, but there's also reason as a psychologist, it's like there's, yeah, we have you know confirmation bias and all kinds of psychological ways where we can fool ourselves. So we've got to be aware of that too. And it's also true that if some of those phenomena are real, it doesn't mean that 99% of palm readers aren't full of shit, you know, <laughs> like both can be true. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean that everyone claiming to you know, be sensitive to these things is. And um, yeah, and there's just other, you know, like I think in terms of it, other things in this category, last one I'll say is like just, um, and it can be political, but, you know, just in one of the real disappointing things with, and now we see evidence of kind of things that went on behind the scene, like with the, with the pandemic, how like things just became so politicized and how, just even like the idea that like, well, this virus could have escaped from this lab that was working on viruses, including plans to potentially to 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 engineer viruses to have this capability in the spirit of getting ahead of the curve and like, you know, you know, building ways to potentially defeat that. Mm. The whole idea that that was so absurd that because it showed up in this area that it was just you know, it was just scientifically like, you know, mum's the word. And I really think there was a fear that like, yeah, man, if you were funded by, you know, NIH, you know, good, you know, good luck, especially the, the, you know, the allergy and disease, whichever one Anthony Fauci was in charge of, like you're, yeah, like you wouldn't, don't hold your breath for, for another grant. I mean, it's reasonable for someone to have that, you know, um, fear, you know, and so you just saw these kind of this, I don't know, it just on, on all sides, like no matter what kind of someone's politics are, that seems like there was this kind of shifting into camps where like beliefs became like um, badges mm. where there really wasn't any naturalistic connection. It's like, you know, like these are all things we could do science on. It's like the, all these questions that came up about masks and about the origin of the virus and all this stuff and i yeah i think at least some of those things turn out on the side i mean I, i'm typically pretty liberal guy but some of these things turned out to be the things that initially the more conservative folks were <laughs> vouching for and then it just but then just sort of like see no evil hear no evil like and just like this inability to follow the science so that's that's another kind of area where i think just in general you know um thankfully now things have shifted i mean there's like it's very mainstream to say yeah it's decent i think it's very you know like there's a decent chance we don't know but like people have different opinions but it's at least like there's 
government agencies to say, yeah, that's the most likely thing. It came from this lab, you know? So, but there was a time where that was just like, you know, you're going to be thrown off the island, <laughs> you know, like even to raise that kind of, you know, common sense, at least question. And so for a while we were in that period where, you know, that was just something that was beyond the pale. And I just, cause it was so politically charged and I'm, it does make me fearful how we mm. respond in other emergencies uh, when we really have to figure things out and we have to look at data like really quickly mm. and how we're just kind of burning our credibility um, societally. Um, so that's, yeah, that kind of just general category of response to COVID was one where I think that's part of this where I think people weren't um yeah it, it seemed like there we weren't sensitive to aspects of reality because it was just sort of it 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 was seen it seemed like it was outside of mainstream consensus hmm. and yeah i think it it you know to our detriment um these reactions are bordering on heresy <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, when you have tribes and you have your sacred cows in your own individual tribes, I mean, this is why independent thinking is so unusual because we're pack animals. Um, and right. it, when you have your tribe and you have your herd, uh, historically, if you spoke out against the assumed beliefs, the cherished truths of your tribe, you were risking your life. Um, and in some way that hasn't changed that much that you now are, maybe you won't be killed, but you could be fired, lose Banned your ability Twitter, to pay your mortgage. Yeah, yeah. Lose your grants. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's scary. And I think we actually, I think it, I want more acceptance of like, it's okay that people disagree with you. Like we actually need like society should work by not like, like natural selection. The, the magic of natural selection is like, you need variability yeah. and that's going to mean some people are wrong, but we need, I mean, that's the way that our court system of justice works. It's like right or wrong. Give me the best argument, get a lawyer defending this person and get, you know, it's, they're not doing something immoral. Like we just like that. The way we can get at the truth is saying, give, do your best job arguing this and then do your best job arguing this. And then we'll, let it settle out and then we'll see. So we need like if there's someone that's arguing that whatever it is like that, like say about the vaccine and other aspect, I, I want to hear the best arguments for all. You know, I want to see the data and I want to see the best arguments that are to be had on any perspective. And and I we get into a weird territory, even if you convince someone is wrong, it'd be like, OK, but, you know, like let that person speak, because then if people are afraid of being thrown off the island then like we're never going to have the ability to to sort out what what truth is like we have to be okay with people disagreeing with us and being cool with it. it's like that's okay um <laughs> it, 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 yeah i mean we can have fun with each other and be like we could even tease each other about it. we don't have to be it doesn't mean they're necessarily like an evil person um because we might think they're a whack job, but like, whatever, it's like, that's kind of what an enlightened society is based on the ability for whack jobs to, to say it's, you know, it's like free speech, the ability for people to say something. And it's like, well, you know, like people don't have to listen to that. And, you know, then you can say something, you could say the person's wrong, but when you try to muzzle that person, it's, uh, it's, yeah, we're going down a dangerous road. I don't know how any adult after a certain age couldn't look back at their own life and what they used to say and used to believe and not think at least in a few instances, I was that whack job. Yeah, Things that yeah I, I definitely yeah. was. I definitely was too. And um, I think that can help. But, you know, you mentioned the enlighten enlightenment earlier. It I think these experiences often remind me what a miracle that was and how unusual the kind of scientific method approach you just talked about, which you find in our court system, uh, how that is so 
in many ways against human nature. It's not yeah. easy for us to think that way and to live that way. Um, and, you know, I talk about something to be grateful for the fact that we live in this time where despite our nature, we have these institutions and these principles and these freedoms that um, many people fought very hard for before we were ever around. Right. And in fact, one of my things I have, where I was a whack job earlier, and I think a lot of people go through this phase where it's just sort of like you want to throw at everything. I don't know. It's like humanity is nothing but bad. They're a cancer on the world. And like, you know, it's like sort of the United States is just nothing but, you know, this horrible cancer. And it's like this is this very unbalanced perspective <laughs> because it's like. Yeah, there were some like horrible sins, but like there was also a system of government that really did. It was fighting against all of human nature. And it really was like this absolutely brilliant idea of power corrupts. And we've got to set up this system that's going to be stable. And it was like the model for all of the democracies in the modern world. I mean, it really was revolutionary. And and yeah, like that was as evil as it was limited to white men at the time, you know, but there were at least mechanisms in there that were, that was expanded over time. Mm -hmm. And then we, we fought a war and threw 300,000 plus federal soldiers into the Greek meat grinder to, to rectify that. And so that like, it's sort of like, yeah, like we can't just throw this thing out. Like this is a really this is a system of government that's adaptable and that had human rights at the very even though they were a complete contradiction and even though some of those authors knew that. I mean, Jefferson knew it. Hmm. Like it nonetheless, at least even if they were hypocrites, some of the like human rights were baked into the very beginning. You know, and you know, like the Bill of Rights, where I guess the First Amendment, you know, near the very beginning, like and so, like, there's a lot that's good there, and that the whole idea that like you'd have you, you have your day in court, you have the right to face the, those that are accusing you, you you know, like the, the 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 executive doesn't have unlimited power. That you know, there's all of these things are just like they're brilliant, yeah. you know. And despite all the perverse contingencies that have crept up around that system and as imperfect as it is like it's uh it's still really like you know it's like variations of this are like the only way to go like that you know and we have to be thankful that that we have this yeah like we were gifted this this way to navigate life and form a society that isn't doesn't fall prey to the absolute horrors that we've that can crop up and do crop up yeah i think that's a good place to stop um you know one one quote i love which is about what you were just mentioning and i think about this idea a lot that the line is um don't com compare me to don't compare me to the almighty compare me to the alternative <laughs> Meaning that we we don't live in a perfect world, um, but there are better systems than others. And the trick is just like you said, figuring out what those are and slowly trying to improve them over time. I think so. Um, that's that's something that's always stuck with me. I know I got way more of your time than I asked for, Matthew, and it's getting late. <laughs> it's been on fun Friday. conversation, though. Yeah, it, it really yeah. has, man. And I just yeah. want to close by saying um, how much I have respect for you in your own independence in your own work and i really hope this is just the the start and uh I, I know i speak for a lot of people in expressing that admiration so thank you for all the hard work and determination and independence very cool yeah thanks for saying that dan you got it great to meet you you too